Um, I'm going to give you guys a conversation today about the approach to concussion for pediatric patients and athletes, and we'll be doing a lot of review about more recent practical updates about how we manage this clinical entity. As Aaron already mentioned, I just want to repeat that I have no financial conflicts of interest to disclose. If I happen to use any brand names, it's purely for the ease of communication and purely coincidental. So as we begin our conversation, we'll just talk about some objectives here. We want to discuss the clinical presentations and diagnosis of concussions in pediatric patients. I want to review the underlying mechanisms of neurologic dysfunction that contribute to the symptoms that most patients will complain about. We will navigate a systems-based approach to rehabilitation and returning athletes to play. We'll go over some common pitfalls that may contribute to prolonged concussion recovery in patients. And lastly, we'll do a brief overview of reasons why you may want to refer patients for specialized care. So let's begin with a semi-typical case. Imagine that there is a 15-year-old male soccer player who collides with another player during a game, head to shoulder, and they fall, and he falls to the ground. Imagine that he's slow to get up. <clears throat> he's noted to be wobbly coming off the field. The athletic trainer at the game notes that he's not responding to questions appropriately in terms of uh, the the quickness with which those questions are being asked. And so he's restricted from returning back to the game. He's held out of practice for one week. And before his next scrimmage, he says that he feels all better. And so of course he asks, can I play? I want you guys to be very comfortable by the end of this conversation and the end of this presentation with saying that you don't know, but you just don't know yet. And we'll go into why this is an appropriate response and <clears throat> how to determine the answer to the question can this athlete return back to play? Now, there is a international Congress on concussion that meets on a semi-regular basis. Um, and every time they meet, they put out a consensus statement that reviews the most recent updates in the management of concussion and the most recent research. And they put out a consensus statement to inform practitioners throughout the world on how to approach concussion, pati <clears throat> concussion patients of all ages. The most recent consensus statement was put out in October of 2022 um, after the conference met in Amsterdam. And we'll go over some highlights of what was updated. First and foremost, we'll talk about what a concussion actually is. Now, the definition of a concussion is that it's a shaking injury to the brain. And there has been a recent push to even change the um, approach to the word to be mild traumatic brain injury. And in a lot of ways, this is pretty appropriate. But unlike more severe types of traumatic brain injury, those imaging studies like CT scans and MRIs, the ones that are most routinely performed and those that are most universally available, the results of these studies are typically normal in patients who have a concussion. Now, I do wanna make a note that I'm not including research level imaging studies. There are certain types of very specialized MRIs, such as those with diffuse tensor imaging and functional MRI machines. These machines are not necessarily universally available, and they in fact may show some abnormalities when performed on patients who have suffered a concussion. But among the vast majority of routine CTs and MRIs that are obtained in patients who have a concussion, the results will uh, basically be normal. However, we know that the function of the brain is abnormal soon after this shaking injury. And this may be proposed because of changes in neurotransmitters, changes in microscopic blood flow, uh, changes on the actual axons of the neurons of the brain themselves, as well as local inflammatory responses. These, of course, cannot easily be picked up on imaging studies, hence the norm normal results of these imaging studies. The symptoms that patients usually complain about can be headaches, dizziness, nausea, fatigue, and lightheadedness. Of course, this is not all-encompassing in terms of all symptoms that patients with concussion suffer, but just probably the, some of the most common ones. And these symptoms are, are thought to onset soon after injury. Now, the soon after injury is still a little bit open to interpretation. In general, it is thought that the symptoms that follow the shaking injury to the brain onset within minutes to hours after the injury itself. It would be relatively uncommon for symptoms to present days after the injury. Probably the biggest question that we should tackle first is how do we reliably make a diagnosis of a patient who ha has had a concussion? This is an important 
question to begin with because concussion is exclusively a clinical diagnosis. As I've already mentioned, imaging studies are typically normal in patients that have the, the, the um, injury. And there are no reliable lab tests that have so far been discovered or so, so far been described that accurately make the diagnosis for us. And I want pra practitioners who are taking care of patients who have concussion to be very comfortable with noticing when an athlete or a patient has had an appropriate style of injury to the head neck area, and then appropriately evaluating them for presence of symptoms associated with that injury. If you have these two phenomena together, that is what makes up the clinical diagnosis of a concussion. Now, as part of the sixth consensus statement, some of the updates that are worth talking about include updates to something called the concussion recognition tool. Now, this sixth iteration of this tool is a handout that allows practitioners, such as athletic trainers, physicians, nurses, et cetera, um, to have a systematic way of assessing athletes who are suspected to have a concussion. The first half of the document, <clears throat> pardon me, the first half of the document simply highlights some red flags um, and reasons why you might want to seek emergent medical attention. And those reasons can include things like a patient who has had an injury and is having repeated vomiting, who's having, <clears throat> pardon me, who's having increasing headache, um, or who has something like a visible deformity of the skull. Those would be reasons to seek emergent medical attention. The second half of the document, however, goes over some very common signs and symptoms that are typically described to follow patients who have had a concussion, including drowsiness, uh, nausea, issues with balance, changes in mood, changes in behavior, agitation, these sorts of things. It's important to take a look at this document uh, whenever you are reviewing patient, reviewing a uh, potential scenario where you may be covering a situation where concussions may occur. Um, as a refresher to prepare yourself for managing this issue on the field. The other document, that was updated um, is something called the SCAT, which is the Sport Concussion Assessment Tool. This document has undergone five iterations and now a sixth one after the most recent consensus statement. The newer parts of this document are that there are some enhanced athletic demographics that have been instituted. The assessment section has been revised for immediate assessment after injury. The red flags have been revised. And perhaps the most important update and one that I will be focusing on a little bit early, later in this talk um, is the new oculomotor screening tool, which is now part of the SCAT. Additionally, the read aloud section has been removed for symptoms. The five word memory recall has now been expanded to 10 and the repetition of months in reverse is now timed. Now, as I go forward through this presentation, I've highlighted the most recent major updates from the consensus statement in 2022. We could potentially spend the rest of this talk just reviewing the different sections of the SCAT and the CRT themselves, but I think that that's not the most valuable use of our time, as these are resources that anybody can have access to through simple um, internet engine, uh, internet search engine, and looking them up yourselves. Um, and I'll go a little bit more into detail about the actual clinical diagnosis and how to uh, navigate a systems-based approach. So how do we optimize care to foster recovery? What we can conceptualize now about patients who have had a concussion, and this is true of patients of all ages and certainly true of patients that are pediatric, is that there are a couple of common neurological domains that are commonly affected in patients who have had a concussion. These are related to exercise intolerance, the abnormalities noted in visual and vestibular senses, cognition itself, and mood. What we understand now is that each one of these domains must be individually addressed and rehabilitated before patients can be considered recovered and returned back to their activities. To begin with, we'll start with exercise tolerance. Now, when we discuss exercise tolerance, it's important to note that we are speaking specifically about abnormalities in the autonomic nervous system of the brain. What we have learned through some preliminary studies is that concussion seems to affect things that are primarily controlled by the autonomic nervous system centrally, things such as ventilation, cerebral blood flow, and the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Of course, all of these things are altered during exercise, and those alterations are thought to cause some of the symptoms associated with concussion, and particularly the ones that seem to be exacerbated when patients try to exercise. So we know that the autonomic nervous system is responsible for these important mechanisms, uh, which include breathing, heart rate regulation, and as I already mentioned, carbon dioxide. 
So one might want to ask the question, these are such critical and important parts of how the autonomic nervous system manages um, normal function of the brain. So is it even safe for patients who are concussed to exercise? Initially, it was thought that it might not be safe, um, as it was learned that forced early exposure to high level and high intensity exercise soon after a concussion can worsen recovery. But more recent data has suggested that it is actually quite safe and perhaps even the standard of care to expose patients who have had concussions to different levels of exercise. This randomized clinical trial took adolescents who were concussed and separated them into two groups and exposed one to a sort of stretching and, and rest protocol and another to a very gradual sub-threshold, sub-symptom threshold aerobic exercise protocol where each day athletes were asked to exercise and increase their level of intensity based on symptoms and to stay just below the symptom threshold. What this study found and what has since been found in subsequent studies that have repeated these exact um, uh, methods is that exposing patients soon after concussion to a very graded aerobic exercise protocol enhances the ability of patients to recover from a concussion very reliably. So this now informs our standard of care. In the acute phase after a concussion, patients should be asked to rest for at least the first 24 to 48 hours. But beyond that, it's not necessary to continue to rest the athlete any longer. Now, I want to caution and say that I don't think it is necessarily safe to expose them to a sport at a level that may cause a second head injury. However, it is very safe and likely very helpful to allow them to start doing sub-symptom threshold, non-contact, non-high-risk aerobic exercise. This would include things like treadmill, exercise bike, running, those sorts of things. And in fact, that's better than absolute rest as it very much seems to improve the rate of recovery. There are a lot of different ways that you can kind of um, approach this subsymptom threshold protocol. One such um, method is just to use something like this. Initially, you'd start out with light exercise, walking or biking. If the athlete is able to tolerate that, you'd move on to some sports specific activity. Then you do some resistance training. Eventually, when the athlete has shown that they can tolerate maximal exertion with no symptoms from a non-contact standpoint, you can ask them to return back to a practice with their team to include body contact. And if they tolerate that, you can return them back to play. And the progression through these five steps is simply based on if it provokes any symptoms. Now, the risks of this are quite minimal, especially when you are being, your athlete is being monitored. The main risk is that you may exacerbate symptoms if an athlete is quite, not quite ready to do maximal exertion and they attempt to do so, they're going to feel the symptoms of that, but there's no reason for us to believe that as long as they have been protected from another head injury, there's no reason to believe that exacerbating symptoms causes any long-term issues. Um, however, what we do know is that if athletes, because of their motivation to try to return back to their sport, consistently push through their symptoms to try to prove that they can return, and every time they do it, they're exacerbating their symptoms, we do know that doing that repetitively can overall prolong the recovery process. And so it's really important to know that so that we can provide appropriate counseling to patients and their families that if you are symptomatic, you should actually stop, slow down rather than try to push through as that seems to be um, not helpful. It actually seems to make you take longer to recover. So ideally what we'd like to do is find the correct dose of, of exercise um, in order to treat the athlete each day and to get them back to their level of play in a safe manner. There's some recent uh, publications talking about the utility of using multi-directional movement when assessing patients and their abilities to return back to sport appropriately. What was discovered is that when you expose patients who have been concussed to an exercise protocol and you increase the intensity of their exercise each day, particularly you're trying to get them to get to a higher percentage of their maximal heart rate. What was discovered is that you can do this in a linear fashion, such as just using an exercise bike or just using a treadmill and pushing them further and further in terms of intensity. And you may come to the conclusion that when they get to a situation where they're doing their maximal intensity and they're able to tolerate it, you may be under the influence that they would be safe to return back to high level activity, such as returning back to a sport that requires cutting, pivoting, and those sorts of things. However, it's been noted that when those same athletes who can tolerate linear exertion are exposed to 
a exercise protocol that is non-contact, but now includes multi-directional movement, such as having to balance, quickly stop, change direction, jump, pivot, these sorts of things, which are very sport specific, specifically for high level sports like soccer and uh, football and basketball, those sorts of things. Up to a one fifth of them, although they had no symptoms with linear acceleration, will develop symptoms with multi-directional movement. Thus, that indicates that there is something continuing to recover in the brain that has not quite got, gotten back to normal yet. And so it's insufficient to return patients back to sports simply based on their ability to tolerate linear exertion only. It is important before they get returned back to their high-level sport to institute a non-contact multidirectional movement protocol to ensure that they're able to also tolerate that because we know that that will be protective in allowing them to ensure appropriate brain recovery but before exposing them to higher risk by returning them to their contact sport. The second neurologic domain that we're gonna go over is about the visual and vestibular system. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, this system has been now incorporated into the SCAT um, as, as part of the sixth iteration of the SCAT. And it's very, very important. It's, it's important because it provides us with a set of objective findings that we can utilize to both make the diagnosis of the concussion clinically and to monitor the recovery of patients over time. And we're gonna go into a little bit of detail about what that means. So some preliminary data years ago discovered that if you take a bunch of adolescents who are concussed and you evaluate their vision and vestibular system, up to two thirds of them have been noted to have Diagno vision diagnoses that are abnormal. Most of those seem to be accommodative and convergence insufficiencies, and we'll talk about exactly what that means. And up to a fourth or beyond can have saccadic dysfunction. We'll talk about that as well. Um, and sometimes patients had even more than one. So we seem to now know that when a patient has a concussion, their vision system, their vestibular system is affected, um, and it's likely affected in almost all patients who have it. Now, how do we assess for that? How do we figure that out? What I usually describe to athletes and their, and their families when they come to see me is that when a patient is concussed, it's not that there is something structurally that is now damaged within the brain itself, but rather the function of the brain is now altered in a way that the vision system is now not functioning properly. And the way we would assess that is through these set of physical exam maneuvers that have now been known as the VOMS or the vestibular ocular motor screen. The purpose of this is to evaluate how quickly the eyes move in different directions, how well do they accommodate, how well do they converge, and then to prompt from the athlete during the testing to see if it's provoking any symptoms. The way that we typically do this uh, assessment is to start with smooth pursuits where you simply hold a pen, pencil, or your own finger in front of the athlete and ask them to follow the finger in space with their eyes only while keeping their head still. And you're trying to see if they're able to do it easily. You're trying to see if the athlete can keep the eye, keep the eyes in focus on the object itself. And then at the end, you wanna ask them, how much does it bother you? Um, is it provoking any symptoms? Following this would be psychotic testing, where you hold two fingers or two objects up about shoulder length apart. And you ask the athlete to look with their eyes left and right as quick as they can, focusing on each object. After about 25, 30 repetitions of this, you wanna ask the athlete, is this bothering you? Is it clear? Um, and then after doing it horizontally, you wanna repeat the test vertically. Now, many times you might notice that this very much seems to provoke symptoms in athletes. And you kind of already have your answer at that point. Any athlete who has had a suspected head injury or suspected concussion, who is being evaluated on the sideline, if you perform this screen and you're noticing that the athlete is struggling, it's causing symptoms, it's not making them feel well, that should be setting off alarm bells that is very likely that this patient has suffered a true concussion. They should likely be removed from play for that day and they should be assessed serially to ensure that they're recovering appropriately. After the psychotic testing, the other tests that this screen utilizes include convergence testing, holding an object a certain distance away from the patient's eyes, and then having them focus on the object as you bring it closer and farther away. The idea is that at some point, the eyes will not be able to keep the object looking like one object, and then in fact, the object will split or look like two. The generalized, normalized distance from the face of which this is supposed to be accepted as a normal value is approximately six centimeters. 
So if they're not able to keep the object looking like one object up to six centimeters, for example, let's say that at 10 centimeters from their face, it now starts to look like two, that would be an abnormal finding and likely indicative that the patient has uh, potentially has acquired a head injury. Following this would be testing of vision, mo visual motor sensitivity. This is where an athlete holds their own thumb or their own pen or pencil ahead of them. And while stabilizing their head and neck area, they're gonna twist in different directions. And so the object that they're holding will stay in, in um, focus, but the background will become blurry as they're moving. This is to check the visual motion sensitivity. And this translates to motion sickness after concussion. So if this is a very abnormal test, it's not uncommon for athletes in that scenario to have issues related to um, not tolerating being on long car rides or being on long um, plane rides and those sorts of things. And then lastly, the vestibular ocular reflex is um, the last sort of uh, exercise tool that you can use to, to engage um, an athlete in and see if they are suffering symptoms of a concussion. This is when they have the object held in front of their eyes in a stable manner. And instead of their eyes moving, they're just gonna move their neck left and right and then move their head up and down. Again, trying to engage the, the vestibular system and seeing if that's affected in any way. So this comprehensive tool, although it took me a little while to get through it and explain it, is really, really useful as it can be done quite easily on the sidelines and quite easily at the point of contact when patients are, are, are suspected to suffer from a concussion. And so it's very worthwhile to review this and um, have a good understanding of how to utilize this tool. In addition to the fact that it can be assisting us in understanding if a patient has the diagnosis of a concussion itself, we also know that there's an inverse relationship between symptoms provoked by this VOM screen and exercise tolerance itself. So when you're assessing an athlete and you notice that they're very much struggling to do the physical exertion of the eyes moving in different directions as you're prompting them to, the more symptomatic they seem, it seems to infer that they'll have lower tolerance of exercise. That helps us to know that if an athlete has significant issues with, with their vestibular ocular motor system, then it's likely that they likely won't tolerate exercise very well that day. And so you may not necessarily want to provoke them and try to push them too hard that day because it is unlikely that they'll um, have a, uh, a great outcome. Um, this is not to say that the next day you assess them or the next week you assess them, it doesn't necessarily mean that their vestibular ocular motor screen will continue to be recovering at a slow rate. It just means that at the time you're assessing it, if they're very symptomatic, then exposing them to high levels of exercise that day is not necessarily useful. However, if you assess them a week later and you notice that their vestibular ocular motor screen is much improved, then that is indication that they likely will tolerate exercise that day. And it's worthwhile to try to encourage them to do a little bit more. The reason that it's important to do this in tandem is that when patients are concussed and their brain is recovering, keeping them at lower levels of exercise than what their brain can truly tolerate is going to slow down their recovery. So if they can tolerate significant more exertion, but to not to provoke symptoms, we are asking them to maintain a lower level of exercise capacity then it will take longer for us to get to the end goal of returning these athletes back to play successfully. So it's important to serially monitor these patients and make sure these two systems, the exercise tolerance and the vestibular ocular system, to make sure that they're actually improving in tandem together and to use decisions that um, bounce between these two in order to return athletes back to play successfully. In addition to the eye abnormalities, leading to issues with exercise tolerance. We know that school activities are very eye dependent. Reading, taking notes, these sorts of things are very intensive in terms of what the brain is actually trying to do. It's a very complicated assortment of neurons and firing that, that in a very coordinated effort. And so if a patient is concussed and their visual vestibular system is affected, it's very likely that the eye abnormalities you find on your physical exam are gonna translate to struggles in school. This is, again, an important thing to know about so that it's it's easier to write accommodations and to let schools, school nurses, school teachers know that you are caring for this athlete, that they are expected to have some struggles in this regard because of your evaluation and examination, and to appropriately provide accommodations so that they can successfully get through school. Now, we know 
we are now learning more and more about the abnormalities in the vision system and the vestibular system. And this policy statement put out in 2022 by the American Academy of Pediatrics was actually a joint venture between optometry, ophthalmology, and pediatrics. And this tool just simply, uh, this policy statement just simply reviews a lot of what we just talked about, about the importance of evaluating for vision and vestibular abnormalities in patients who are concussed, particularly pediatric patients, and how to do that as we just mentioned, and what to do with that information. Lastly, on this section, we'll talk about some subclinical factors. As we've already mentioned, we know that some patients who are concussed have issues related to exercise intolerance, where they're not able to quite get back to their level of exercise capacity because they are having symptoms when they try to do so. What we now know is that even though they don't note that they have any balance issues when you are asking them during your history and physical evaluation, there do appear to be some subclinical balance issues that are provoked in patients who, in, in a subset of patients who are concussed. So in this uh, sort of pilot abstract, what happened was that we, we had patients who came in to see us and we exposed them to exercise and we monitored their balance using force plates, computerized force plates, before and after their activity. And we found that among those that report that reported no symptoms prior to the start of activity, but then had symptoms afterwards, so they had some uh, sort of exercise intolerance, reliably, their balance seemed to be affected post-exercise compared to pre-exercise. So it seems to be that those who fail exertional testing have abnormal sway velocities, meaning they have worse balance issues after exercise. And this is important to know because the patients themselves aren't necessarily aware of this. They don't, they don't know that they are having symptoms of a concussion, that they're still symptomatic until they're exposed to exercise and then they're tested. And so this is another reason why it's very important to monitor patients' non-contact, non-high-risk exercise capacity before they return back to sport because symptoms of a concussion that seem to have gone away in activities of daily living can be provoked once patients are exposed to exercise. So this helps for our, our pediatric patients who are not even athletes. If you have a, a patient who's not an athlete, they may never be in a situation where they're exercising regularly. So you may be falsely reassured that, that they've recovered. However, even in them, it's important to encourage them to exercise simply so we can figure out whether there are some inducible exercise intolerance symptoms in that population. So how do we treat the vision and vestibular problems? We rehabilitate them. Just like we talked about a graded exercise protocol to get their physical exercise capacity to improve and improve their rate of recovery, the same sort of principle can be applied to the visual and vestibular system. This is probably most effectively done under the supervision of either occupational therapy or physical therapy or an athletic trainer who is comfortable in doing the rehab exercises with the athlete and evaluating, evaluating the visual and vestibular system and who has the ability to serially follow the athlete over time to ensure that they are recovering. There are some home exercise programs that are available that athletes can follow, different videos online um, and different handouts that they can have. And that is very helpful and likely will in increase the rate of recovery. But having a supervised professional to oversee this rehab process is the most effective. Thirdly, we'll talk about the, con the, the cognition aspect of the neurologic domain affected by concussion. Probably one of the most important things to realize is that historically speaking, we have been doing what's called a cocoon of patients who are concussed, which means that if you are, have a head injury, if we think that exposing you to too much stimuli is going to be a bad thing. So we ask you not to play any sports. We ask you to not to go to school for a little while. And then when you tell us you feel better, we then encourage you to return back to those things. That seems to work a lot of the times, but not all of the times. And so as we've changed our standard of care and we're now allowing patients to return back to non-contact, non-high-risk exercise at an earlier time, and we're asking patients to uh, start doing visual and vestibular exercises and therapy, cognition is the third um, domain to tackle. And what we've learned based on this study is that you can return athletes back to school at a relatively early rate, as long as you don't return them back to cognitive activity that is a little too high. So what this graph is showing is that the gold bar or the one that's tailing off the furthest 
are a subset of patients who have been concussed who are exposed immediately after their head injury to 100% cognitive activity. So for example, if they were a high schooler who was in school, they had a head injury, they had a concussion, and they were immediately returned back to the same level of cognitive activity as they were prior to injury. They seemed to take the longest to recover. So the, the x-axis is days of recovery to, um, to, to fully recover from their head for their concussion. They seem to take the longest. However, the other three lines are different levels of exposure that is less than 100%. So 75%, 50%, and 25%. And you can see that those are all crowded together. This indicates that there are safe levels of cognitive activity that patients who are concussed can return back to without a risk of prolonging symptoms overall or prolonging their recovery. And in fact, we should be doing this. This is more helpful because it prevents uh, athletes who are in school from falling too far behind. If you have an athlete who's also doing cognitive activity in the form of, of, of work and they're dependent on that work in any way, this gives us a chance to return them back to some level of meaningful work um, to, to improve that outcome. So there are different ways that we can protect patients. Um, initially, of course, if they're very symptomatic, it is not unreasonable to keep them out of school or cognitive activity for a couple of days. So you may put them in what's called the red zone where they're completely resting. However, soon afterwards, it is reasonable to get them at least back to partial days of school, to get them in um, at least half day, maybe a quarter of the day. And the stimulation from being in the learning environment, it can be helpful in improving their rate of recovery, as well as preventing them from falling too far behind. Um, it is important to note though, that the way that to approach these athletes may be to say something like, I want you to return back to school, but we're using school as a rehabilitation tool. So. I don't want you to go back to school and try to do 100% of your cognitive activity, try to take every exam, every quiz, and pass it and do well as you were doing compared to prior to injury. Instead, I want you to just be in the learning environment, learn passively, take frequent breaks if you need to, if you have symptom exacerbation. But just try to spend your time in the classroom and just try to absorb information passively. You don't have to take notes on everything. You don't have to turn in every assignment. And it's important to provide accommodative excuses until patients have fully recovered, and then they can return back to their activities and return back to their school and, and complete all of their missed assignments. This is a very effective approach in enhancing recovery um, of, of patients who have been concussed. I usually tell my athletes that the number one rule is we have to first return to learn before we can return to play. And so when I'm evaluating patients and I'm trying to make the decision to return them back to their high level of activity, which may expose them to another head injury, what I usually say is, I need to make sure that the brain is fully recovered in every capacity before we say that it's okay to, for you to return back to a contact sport. So what that means is, in addition to you being able to tolerate maximum exercise, including multi-directional movement, in addition to you being able to tolerate all of my eye testing, my visual and vestibular tracking and eye exercises, I need you to be able to get through full days of cognitive activity, start to finish, and functioning at a level without symptoms, the way that you were prior to your original injury. These three things that I'm looking for in terms of recovery are very important for us to feel confident that the brain is optimally prepared to return back to high-level activity. The last uh, domain we'll talk, talk, talk about today would be the mood domain. This one is, is quite a bit of a challenge. Lots of studies have indicated that patients who are concussed have some abnormalities in terms of overall mental health outcomes. Um, those suffering a concussion are at increased risk of things like depression, anxiety, um, and are more are more susceptible to stress, both acutely and chronically. It's thought to be very very multifactorial. When patients are concussed, they're removed from their normal environment, so they're asked not to be with their usual teammates. They're removed from the classroom. They tend to fall behind in school. They feel upset because they're not able to play their sport, which they care about a lot. And so those factors play a role, but the injury itself likely plays a role as well. There have been studies that have indicated that there's some in increased pro-inflammatory molecules or cytokines that are, that are released at the tissue level in the brain itself. And they seem to be persistently elevated for a prolonged period of time and can potentially lead to post-traumatic brain injury depression symptoms. Most of this has been tested in patients who have had more severe traumatic brain injuries rather than a concussion, but it, there's no reason to think that that, that sort of... Um, cytokine release is also not present at a lower level in patients who have been concussed. And it's likely that that's contributing. So how do we clear athletes back 
how do we feel comfortable that they can return back to their sport and that they're safe to return back to something that may expose them to contact again? As I mentioned again, I'll review it one more time. The number one thing is we want to make sure that they can tolerate 100% of contact, 100% of, of exercise capacity, including multidirectional movement, before they return back to um, exposing themselves to a contact. And so what that could be is that your protocol that has five steps, they'd have to clear the fifth step. And that fifth step should institute multidirectional movement, ladder drills, agility drills, those sorts of things. And athletes who are returning back to that kind of sport need to demonstrate that they can pass that sort of high level non-contact activity and not have any symptoms. In addition to that, they need to be able to get back into all cognitive activity without having the need for any accommodations. So they shouldn't need any extra time to complete assignments. They shouldn't need uh, pre-printed notes. They should be functioning in school with no symptom exacerbation. They should feel like the classroom feels the same as now as it was compared to prior to their injury, original injury. Thirdly, as you're serially following their visual and vestibular exam, if they were symptomatic initially, those symptoms with the exam needs to completely resolve. None of those exam maneuvers should be provoking any symptoms. Athletes should feel that the eyes are in focus whenever they're performing these, these tasks. And lastly, they should be telling you that they're symptom free. They don't have any daily symptoms. They don't have any symptoms with cognitive activity. They don't have any symptoms with physical exertion. And if they had any mood abnormalities, those should be resolved by now. Now, I will say that there are a small subset of, of patients who have mood abnormalities that seem to persist. Um, if that is the only thing that persists and everything else is normal, it is likely that the that the the phase of concussion itself is is resolved and there's some underlying mood abnormalities that potentially may have been instigated by the head injury, or they may be mood abnormalities that the patient was susceptible to developing anyway. And as long as those are being addressed, either through therapy, counseling, medications, whatever the whatever the uh, the treatment modality is, and as long as the other aspects of the clearance are are appropriate, those athletes can still be returned safely back to sport. So how long does recovery generally take? Well, depending on the sort of source one looks at, about 80 to 85% of adolescents who suffer a concussion will get better on their own within a couple of weeks. So this means that they don't necessarily need to um, be in any regimented exercise protocol. They don't need to be doing formal vision therapy or vestibular therapy. They seem to just recover on their own spontaneously. But 10 to 20% of them may do seem to have prolonged symptoms. Um, and there's many reasons for that. Probably the biggest reason is that there are some exercise induced symptoms as we talked about earlier that cause issues. And so this, this paper found that those who had vision abnormalities caused by exercise after their concussion tended to have a longer recovery process. They tended to take longer to get better. So we know that um, there are some specific clinical factors that we can assess for in patients that may lead to prolonged recovery or take longer for, for certain athletes to get better. And those are that if you are a adolescent female, the recovery rate seems to be a little bit longer for you. Um, this is a very fascinating topic because it's not clear why that is. What recent studies have actually indicated is that when adolescent females suffer a concussion, they may not say, they may not provide you with a diary of symptoms that are what is classically taught. Um, and so they may not present early uh, to healthcare providers, um, not because it's their, not because of any other reason other than they don't describe their symptoms in a typical fashion. And so what happens is that it takes longer for them to get seen by a, by a provider that can properly evaluate them and get them on the pathway to recovery. And so it's thought that that delay in getting the right care compared to their male counterparts may be contributing to the reason why they take longer to get better. And in fact, a recent study that was published by Dr. Letty out of University of Buffalo indicated that if you can get boys and girls on the appropriate treatment pathway at equal rates, they recover at equal rates. So this seems to be an access issue rather than a uh, specific issue related to uh, gender itself or sex itself. Um, so in addition to that, exercise intolerance also seems to uh, cause prolonged recovery. And we've seen many sources today that indicate that 
there are some inducible abnormalities in the brain that are caused by exercise that some patients have and others don't. And if you have that, it's more likely that it will take longer for you to recover from your injury. And those who have history of migraine headaches before their concussion also seem to take longer. It, for reasons we don't fully understand, the, the concussion seems to stimulate more severe and prolonged headache symptoms in patients who have a history of migraines compared to those who don't. And the same is true of those with underlying mood disorders and learning disorders. If you already had that before you got hurt, those symptoms are going to likely get worse after the injury, and it takes longer to work through that. So when would, would it be appropriate to consider referring? Um, the, the general answer is that it's always helpful to refer in patients who have concussed if, if you feel that it's appropriate to refer. But specifically, if you note that there is an athlete who is having some post-exercise symptoms in particular, where they say, you know, I'm not doing any contact, but when I go out there and I jog or I sprint, I like immediately feel very badly. I don't feel well. It doesn't make me feel better. Um, the rest of the day, I don't feel well. Um, that is likely indicative that you're dealing with a patient that may take a little bit longer to recover. And that might be a good idea to refer at that time. If they're having significant school-related symptoms, they're really not able to focus well, it's been weeks and they're still not able to get through full days of school, they're struggling, hard to take notes, hard to focus, that might be a reason to refer. And then if you're just having a sort of a prolonged recovery, they're just not recovering at the rate you'd expect, especially if they're not recovering within about two weeks, which is that subset of population of adolescents that usually get better on their own, then they might need a more targeted approach and it would be completely reasonable for, for considering referral for those for those patients and patients in that population. So it's a pretty comprehensive evaluation of concussion. We talked about recent updates. We talked about the approach. We navigated a systems-based approach. We talked about what to look for, how to approach rehab and recovery. And I wanted to make sure we had plenty of time at the end to um, have a conversation about any questions you guys have. And I'd be happy to do that now. All right. Thank you, Dr. Baraji. And then just a reminder for everyone for the questions, we'll go through, um, if you guys can put your questions in the Q&A, and then we'll go through as many questions as we can. Um, Dr. Balaji, so one of the questions that came came up that I'll repeat a few times was um, about screen time. Like, what's your advice for, like, using the screen time recommendation and then, um, like, electronic devices that they use at all? Is that going to delay the concussion recovery? Or how, how does that, what do you recommend? Excellent. Excellent question. And in fact, I probably should have put a slide on this. There was a recent paper that was published about two, two and a half years ago that showed that patients who are acutely concussed and are exposed to significant levels of screen time within 48 hours of their head injury seemed to take a little bit longer to recover. So there's something about that 48 hour window where the cocooning effect of protecting patients from school, protecting them from screens and protecting them from exercise is probably more helpful than exposing them to those things right away. And so I would say that the first two days or three days from head injury, minimizing patient exposure to screen time is likely effective in enhancing their recovery. After that window, it doesn't seem to make much of an effect. Um, what I would say though, and this is usually how I counsel patients is, that if you are using screen time during your concussion recovery to do a lot of fun things, and it's provoking a lot of symptoms that you're pushing through. And then it's kind of exhausting you in a way that you can't, you can't do your physical exertion, you can't do your eye exercises, and you can't do school properly, then screen time is not helping. And so we need want to minimize that. However, if you're utilizing screen time as a tool to enhance your cognitive abilities, so you're using screen time because you need the screen to access a school assignment, then that would be perfectly fine. And once you are fully recovered and you've been fully cleared, you can go back to whatever level of screen time you would like to use. So the, the take home message would be the first two to three days after an injury, we probably wanna minimize exposure to screen time as it seems to cause a delay in recovery. And then after that, utilize it only as a tool for recovery until you are fully recovered. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, <clears throat> another question we had was for the, when they go back to the exercise and sports. So if they, if they're aggravating symptoms, can you just clarify again, should they continue, are they, are they okay to continue with the exercise if they're having symptoms or do they, should they stop exercise or take a step back? Sure. Great question. So I, I tell people that the only wrong answer is exposing an athlete to a dangerous situation before they're fully recovered. So the only wrong answer is letting them go back to a sport before they're ready and that sport causing another injury because the subsequent injury while the original injury is still in recovery 
can cause worsening of symptoms and increases the risk that you may develop some permanent issues that we can't really fix. So that's the only wrong answer. However, if you have an athlete who is who is a very high level athlete and is very conditioned and they're concussed and they're starting to feel better and they feel like they really want to push it, they want to they want to do a lot of non-contact high level exertion, it's safe to do that even if it exacerbates symptoms. You just let them know that they're not going to feel well, but it's not going to do any we don't have any reason to believe anyway that it's going to do any permanent damage. So if you've got an athlete who has developed symptoms with non-contact exertion, I usually tell athletes, I want you to push it a little bit, but not too much. And I usually say like, follow the two point rule. So what that means is give yourself a, a number from one to 10 in terms of what your symptoms are that day before you start exercise. So let's say you have like a two out of 10 headache before you start exercising. It is okay to exercise up until that two out of 10 can become a four out of 10. If it becomes worse than that, we're probably pushing it too hard. Let's take a break. Let's slow it down. Let's recover and rest. However, if you're able to do 30, 45 minutes, an hour of exercise, and you never go beyond that two-point mark, it's safe to do that. And in fact, it's probably going to help you. It's probably going to enhance your recovery. So to find that fine line between resting too much and pushing too hard, I usually use this two-point rule. And I also apply this two-point rule also to when they're doing visual and vestibular exercises with their therapist it's going to provoke symptoms a little bit and that's okay. I just don't want it to provoke too many symptoms that you feel terrible because that'll make the recovery longer. And this is true of school. If staying at school for half a day causes you to feel terrible, but a quarter of the day, it just, it, it bothers you a little bit, but not too much, then let's stay at a quarter until we can push it beyond that. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> I think another, another question that people are having for like, um, like if you if you do like the vestibular rehab afterwards, does it have to be like acute like right away or like let's say they had delayed symptoms and you use it like a month later? Does it make a difference when you how soon they should progress start that program or later sooner or later? Great question. Um, this is a is a topic of high debate. We don't really know um, because there is a subset of patients, as I mentioned in the slides, where they're just going to get better in two weeks no matter what you do, and so you just need to wait. So for those patients who have visual vestibular abnormalities soon after their head injury, and they're in that two week window, they may just get better on their own and you might just need to just protect them until they're completely recovered. So some practitioners around the country might argue, wait two weeks and if they have persistent abnormalities at that time, then start doing the exercise protocol and the, and the visual vestibular protocol. Um, I'm of the persuasion that maybe like one week is probably enough time. If you're not seeing significant improvement within one week, like they're not telling you, you know, if they were injured on a Monday and you're seeing them the following Monday and they say, I'm getting better a lot faster, you may not need to do much except for just follow them until they're fully cleared. However, if they say, I'm still struggling, then it's very likely that abnormalities you find in the visual vestibular exam that day are going to last longer. And it's more important to institute the protocol early. I don't think we're going to do any harm by instituting vision vestibular exercises as early as possible. As long as they follow the two point rule and they're not like forcing symptoms every day, it's not going to prolong their recovery. It will only help. It'll either do nothing or help. And if you find them one month later and you start the, 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 the protocol at that time, perfectly fine. At, at any time you institute it, if it, if they're symptomatic, it's going to help them as long as they're doing it properly. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, are there any like supplements you recommend with recovery or like, um, like melatonin or using like um, Tylenol or Advil for headaches afterwards? Like do, do they speed recovery or are they okay to use? Yeah, great question. Um, in terms of Tylenol and ibuprofen, I'll talk about that first. Um, what, we, what we know is that if you have a history of a migraine headache disorder before you get concussed, the headaches you have after your concussion in that subset those do seem to respond to ibuprofen and Tylenol. And so the idea is, you know, if you had migraine headaches and then you get a concussion and you have headaches from a concussion, if you had migraine headaches already, then you might benefit from Tylenol and ibuprofen. If you haven't had a migraine disorder diagnosis before your concussion and you have post-concussion headaches, it's not clear to me and the data doesn't show that Tylenol and ibuprofen does anything. If you take it in appropriate doses, it's certainly not gonna do harm, we don't think. But if it's not helping that athlete you know, if you say, oh, hey, give it a shot, and they try it for a couple of days, and it's not doing anything, there's no reason to keep doing it. However, it, if it is helping them, then they can do it on an as needed basis to kind of manage symptoms. So that would be the Tylenol and ibuprofen part of it. If it if they say it helps, 
then appropriate dose is taken as needed is perfectly fine. If it doesn't help and they've tried it a couple of times, no reason to keep doing it. It's not going to do anything magical. In terms of melatonin, another area of hot debate, we're not entirely clear what the right dose of melatonin is and what the right patient is to receive melatonin post-concussion in terms of help facilitating their sleep. We know that sleep abnormalities are a common problem after a head injury. Um, it's unclear exactly how to utilize melatonin. Um, I do think it's relatively safe at taking an appropriate dosage. And we know that physiologically, the dosages that, that are commonly available over the counter for melatonin are super therapeutic compared to what actually is released endogenously in the human body. And so I probably err on the side of sticking with the lowest dosage of melatonin commercially available if you're going to try it. Um, and to try it at the same time every single night, about 45 to an hour before sleep latency or the time that, you, that patients expect themselves to be fully asleep. Um, I haven't found robust data that says it helps a lot, but there is some mm -hmm. low level evidence that it does seem to help. More important than relying on melatonin, however, is appropriate sleep hygiene, which includes shutting down electronics up to an hour before you are going to expect yourself to sleep, um, sleeping in a cool, dark room without any external stimulation, other than maybe like, uh, you know, a brown noise machine or something like that, just, you know, nature noises that you might, you might use regularly to sleep. Apart from that, not having a stimulating environment and trying to sleep at the same time every single night. And in addition to good sleep hygiene, the second thing would be doing the exercise protocol. It is thought that a lot of the sleep abnormalities after a concussion are induced because the autonomic nervous system is not functioning properly. And we know that the only tool we have in our toolbox to assess that is doing graded exercise day by day. And so exposing the athlete to appropriate levels of subsymptom threshold or the two point rule threshold of exercise, that will probably have a greater impact on sleep most of the time, rather than trying to rely on any sort of supplement. And then apart from that, I have not been strongly convinced that any of the other supplements that are commercially available or touted to be super helpful for, for brain recovery are actually helpful. There's some low level evidence that magnesium supplementation can help. I think if you're taking appropriate doses of magnesium, it can be helpful because it's used by neurology to as, a, as an aid to prevent headaches. So there may be some utility in that. Um, fish oil has been touted as, as helpful. I think you know commercially available uh, formulations of fish oil are probably safe to take. I'm not convinced they'll do a lot, but I don't think they'll do any harm. And then by, lastly, I think vitamin D supplementation was one other thing that was, that was highly touted. All of these things are probably perfectly safe if they're taken at the right dosages. Um, but I'm not convinced by the data that they're making a big difference in terms of recovery. Okay. That's great to know. I think we have a time for just a few more questions. We're getting close to the end. Sure. Um, I think one question too that people are asking are, let's say they don't have access to like specialized vestibular rehab or like a concussion specialist in their area. What's your recommendation for like managing training if they don't, they don't really have that specialized care in their area? Yeah. So that's one of the great things about concussion. I think the one thing that a specialized expert provides is simply the experience, but I don't think there's anything in our toolbox that we magically have access to that anyone in the world cannot simply get more familiar with. So the first thing I would say is having a graded exercise protocol that just makes logical sense start to finish is really easy for you to come up with on your own. So you just say, if you've got a patient with a concussion, you don't need an expert to necessarily do this. Just come up with a logical way that you think makes sense in terms of, okay, low level exercise at first, then if they tolerate that, the next day they'll go up, they'll do a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more until they are tolerating full multi-directional movement with no symptoms. And then if they have symptoms in the middle, just go back a day and then try, try to stay at the one that didn't cause symptoms and then go back up. Very, very simple to do, step one. Step two, it's not terribly difficult to just look up vestibular ocular motor screen, get an idea watching some videos, how to do it, and also there are many resources online available that you can refer patients to, to, um, to have them review it and, and, to, and to have them do the exercise themselves. And the, I'll, I'll go back to that slide. There was this slide that I put up on, that was a, a, a joint um, publication from the American Academy of Pediatrics. This one right here, vision and concussion. This, this statement, as it says here on my slide is completely free of access. This is a very useful policy statement to review to get a good idea of what vision abnormalities to look for, how to do the screen, and then how to help patients um, do the rehab even on their own. If they can't get to a therapist, it's possible to do this stuff on your own. Um, and this is a good resource to, to refer to to get started on that. And then lastly, the cognition part is just protecting them from school, giving them excuses so that they're not overwhelmed by school. 
But then when they're showing recovery, to foster that recovery and to enhance their level of school participation. Because as I mentioned, as patients are recovering, we want to support their recovery. We want them to do more and more every day as their brain proves that they can handle more and more. And that enhances recovery. And then lastly, the mood aspect. Most of the time, we're just keeping an eye on the mood. We're just making sure that it doesn't having any, it's not having any alarm bells. They're not severely depressed, severely anxious. Um, and so keeping an eye on that, having them plugged in with a school counselor or a therapist that they can check in with regularly is really, really helpful. And so all of these things, as we've reviewed, are, are things that we can do on, um, you know, universally. There's no special resources that are necessarily needed. Okay, perfect. And then just a reminder for everyone that this um, this is recorded, so it'll be available. So for the resource that Dr. Balaji mentions, those articles, so it'll be in the video. And then, like, we know that we can kind of, you guys can, I know you can find them, like, on PubMed. Is that correct, Dr. Balaji? Yeah, yeah you can find, if they you can't find them on American Academy of Pediatrics, you'll be able to find them on PubMed. Okay. And then last question though, and then um, we have one more time for one more is just um, like, how about like, if you were asking like, you, I know you mentioned it at school, but like, how about just like the recreational reading, does that affect too? Like if they're reading for fun, like does that delay concussions and everything like that, uh, recovery? Probably helps actually. So okay. um, within the first one to two days, maybe take a break. But soon after that, if they're an avid reader, as long as they're following the two point rule and they're not like as long as they don't love reading so much that they're like pushing through headaches to just finish their book, um, as long as they're following the two-point rule and taking breaks periodically, then the fact that the reading action itself is going to cause their eyes to do sort of a little bit of a rehab. And additionally, it's going to engage the cognitive system. We want to do those things to foster recovery. So as long as they're not pushing through symptoms and overdoing it, it's probably going to be very helpful and enhance recovery.